Welcome back to Life Unleashed. I am so excited about today's topic, pre-puppy, pre-dog considerations. So many people come to me and ask me what kind of dog or puppy. They often ask me, should I go to a breeder? Should I go to a rescue? They don't know what to do. And honestly, this is my favorite thing to talk about. So I'm going to take you through it today. Even if you have a dog, there are bits and pieces you can take from this episode and share with your dog or just share with people you meet. So much of having a good dog is this pre-planning to make sure you get a dog that fits with your lifestyle, to know whether you should get a puppy or an older dog and what to look for in a litter of puppies or, or when you go to the shelter to pick out your forever friend. So let's get started. First of all, choosing a dog or puppy. Let's talk about age and stages. So when you bring a puppy home, you're generally going to bring them home around eight weeks to 12 weeks. Now, this is a defined period that starts about five weeks, ends 12 to 14 weeks. And this is known as an imprinting phase. It's a phase of brain development. Fun fact, dogs during this phase need a lot of sleep. They need up to 20 hours of sleep a day and not just any kind of sleep. They need this deep hibernation-like sleep because their brain is growing. And if you take a puppy and you bring them home and you let them sleep in the middle of the kitchen floor and you pick them up whenever you feel like it and you take them in places in the middle of the day, you're interrupting their very important biorhythm. And I know I'm starting off with a very fancy word. A biorhythm is simply the natural sleep-wake cycles of an individual animal. Most everybody is familiar with the term nocturnal. So a nocturnal animal's biorhythm is that they're awake at night and they rest during the day. We're diurnal. We're the reverse. We're awake during the day. We sleep at night. Dogs and other animals are crepuscular, so their biorhythm follows a morning and late afternoon wake cycle, and the rest of the day they're pretty restful. Why is this important to you? It's important because if you choose a puppy, you have to honor their biorhythm, their need for sleep. Puppies go through specific growth phases. So five to 12 weeks, not only is their brain developing, but their teeth are coming in. And everybody who's met a puppy know those sharp, sharp needle teeth. And having a puppy sounds fun. Being nipped by a puppy is less fun. And the more chaotic the environment, the more nippy your puppy will be. Because unlike children who cry when they're needy or deregulated, a puppy bites and it's not the sweet, soft, loving bites they did with their mama. It's hard bites because they're feeling kind of frantic inside. They're overtired. They're overstimulated. So if you're going to get a puppy, you have to honor their development, just as you would a child, to end up with a really good dog. And the goal of puppyhood is that puppy always feels safe always feels connected with you. So if you're short-tempered or you're prone to frustration, maybe having a puppy isn't the best idea because puppies do what puppies do. They pee and poop, sometimes the right place, sometimes the wrong place. They chew stuff, they're jumpy, they're impulsive, and it's up to you to teach them how to regulate their emotional swings. So... I'm definitely down for a puppy. I love puppyhood. I take puppies in and train them. Can't get enough puppies. But I'm very regulated. I understand that dogs don't mean to be bad. They just sometimes choose the wrong behavior to express themselves. For example, I'd like my dog to chew on a bone. But if they're laying next to a wire, they might also chew on the wire. Or I like my dog to sit when I come into a room, but I know puppies are prone to jump because they want to get very close to the face. So I can process all this stuff. But if you're less patient or your life is simply all over the place, you're super busy, you've got kids, you've got a lot of demands, you may not be up for the demands of a puppy. So as puppies develop, they go through periods of muscle growth, bone growth. They go through periods of adolescence 
and puberty where they basically flip you the bird or look at you as though they don't speak the language or you've never met. It's very common. It's rare the dog that doesn't try to stray from its parents, from its territory during this phase of seven to 11 months. So bearing in mind that all dogs, all puppies go through a pretty predictable phases, brain growth, they lose their teeth, they grow up, then they fell out. These are all developmental phases. Maybe you wanna think about adopting an older dog. And even going about that, there are certain pitfalls, pitfalls you want to avoid, like adopting the wrong dog. Okay, so one of the most important things is to get your head around what type of dog or puppy is good for you. And I like you to think about this as like posting a want ad or like meeting somebody on one of the dating apps. This is the one chance you have to pick a family member. And remember, dogs are like children that never grow up. They need daily interaction, walking, playing. They need to eat. They need to drink. Somebody's got to pick up their potty, their little deposits. So this dog is not going to be a part-time companion. It's going to be a full-time companion. And here's your chance to make sure you get the right breed or mix of breeds for your lifestyle. Number one. Breeds can be understood best if you look at what they were originally bred for. Now, someone new to dogs is already probably lost. What does that even mean? So each dog breed had an original intended purpose. For example, a collie was bred to herd sheep. An old English sheepdog also bred to herd sheep. But a Rottweiler was bred to be a watchdog. They would guard their place, their property, their people. So their mindset is going to be different. Then you have like a companion dog, like a Havanese, who's just a sweet, happy, just wants to make everyone happy. Is not terribly protective. Isn't going to go out and pull your sled or fetch a bird for you. But they're a companion dog, so they just want to like hang out with the family. Sporting dogs, dogs bred to fetch things, would of course be prone to fetching, even a tennis ball when a duck isn't available. A hound dog is bred to hunt in, in a pack or in a brace. A brace is two dogs. So a sight hound is bred to run really fast after things that catch their eye. A scent hound is bred to follow a trail. Neither of those dogs care too much about people, but they live congenially within groups. So now you're like, oh, that's interesting. Point of fact, just look at what your dog was bred for and pair it up with what you like to do on a daily basis. So take an honest look at your life. Do you like to exercise or do you prefer to think about exercising and don't get to it that much? If you're like a a marathon runner and you want a dog to be at your side, then make sure you get a breed that can do that. A short-legged bulldog, cute as they are, would get exhausted after like half a block, if they even get that far. So think about what you like to do, not only now, but five years, 10 years from now. If you're somebody in their early 20s and the plan is to have a family, make sure you get a dog that will enjoy adding new members to the household. And also make sure you socialize your dogs to kids. Sure, your lifestyle looks different now, but if your dog is not socialized, that means being exposed in the earliest months of life before three months. Um, if your dog isn't exposed to kids, they're gonna be suspicious because children act more like predators or prey animals than people. So when thinking about what breed or mix of breed, you want to think, what do I enjoy doing every day? What do I envision my dog doing? What will my life look like five, 10 years from now? Then look at each of the breeds and consider it through what you need, not what they look like. As aesthetically beautiful as dogs are, it's their soul, it's their passion, it's their instinct that you're gonna be living with, so make sure it's a good match. Okay, so now where should I get my puppy? I love this question. Once you've figured out what type of dog you're going to get, 
big, small, long hair, short hair, high energy, low energy. Once you've worked all that out, you need to spend a lot of time deciding where to get your new dog or puppy. Whether you're looking for a breeder or a rescue, take a look at the breeder or rescue. Make time to visit if you're local or ask to FaceTime. Feel how open the breeder is to answer your questions. You are generally spending a large sum of money to purchase a new family member and you have the right to ask whatever questions run through your mind. Steer away from breeders who act like they know it all. Mind you, this may be true, breeders generally know more about their breed than you do, but you don't wanna work with someone who belittles you because you're taking this puppy home. The breeder should want to answer your questions, should want to support you in your adoption. Now, a shelter, so the most important person to talk to at the shelter is the owner of the shelter or the manager. Again, you want to look for somebody who is open to questions, who is comfortable to talk to, who is willing to show you several dogs, even if the one you picked off, let's say Pet Finder, doesn't turn out to be the right energy or emotional fit for your lifestyle. Never fall in love with a picture. Never fall in love with a picture. Because as cute as dogs are, as cute as a puppy is, they all grow up and their personality is defined by their behavior, not what they look like. There are so many dogs that need adoption. So go out there and find one that really fits. Let's talk breeder. I feel breeders should be very transparent. I breed about once or twice a year, and I love my puppy families. I am open to any question they have. I need to meet them before they take one of our puppies home, even if they have to fly to meet me. It's critically important that the breeder be invested in their relationship with you. If they have a Facebook or they have a website, look, watch how they interact with their puppies. This is important because a lot of the early training happens five to eight weeks. Is the breeder engaging the puppies? Is the breeder calm with the puppies? Try to avoid breeders that are like having the puppies jump all over the place and squealing and throwing kids in there. If it looks chaotic and unregulated, Avoid that. There are breeders that are regulated and understand what their puppies can tolerate and want to start them off on a good foot to training, teaching them things like sit and come and getting a head start on the housebreaking. So very important with breeders, make sure you connect with the breeder almost like you would with a new friend. In terms of the shelter situation, there are two types of rescues, by the way, or probably three. There's one where the key person brings puppies up, fosters them out, and they don't live at a central location. So those puppies you generally see online, you come up, you meet them, you decide if it's a good fit. There's another type of rescue situation, which is known as a shelter used to be called the dog pound when I was growing up, but I like the word shelter better. Anyhow, these are facilities. They often have multiple kennels, up to 100 or more, and they take in local dogs that are abandoned or left on the street, and they also may rescue dogs from another location. Here in New York, we have what's called the Southern Rescue, where they come up from Texas or Alabama or all those states where dogs are plentiful. Now, when you go to a shelter, ask yourself, is this a friendly environment? Do I feel welcome here? Are the dogs seemingly satisfied? Look around the grounds, is it well organized? Those are all important things to consider before you go in and ask to meet a dog or several dogs. A good shelter person knows each and every one of their dogs and is committed to making sure they get to know you, 
your lifestyle, so that they can successfully pair you with one of their adoptees. I work and volunteer locally at a shelter where I'm from here in Katona, and it's called Rescue, right? I'm there often. I love the person who runs it. She has become a good friend. Why? Because she really cares. And there are many, many shelters across the country and across the world where the people running it really care. They care about each and every one of their dogs. So that's number one. When you go into a rescue, you can go in saying, we'd like a sporting, a relaxed dog. We want a big dog, a little dog. Remember to have that want ad in your head so you can give them as much information about your lifestyle and what you're looking for in a new dog or puppy. Shelters, if you can't find what you're looking for on the day you go, wait two or three weeks. There'll be a whole new population of dogs for you to choose from. And meanwhile, get involved with your local shelters. Go, and dogs are so lonely and they just want affection. Sit on the couch, pet some puppies, pet some dogs. It's a great place for kids to volunteer too. So always think about your local shelter and those dogs that are sitting and waiting there for their forever home. Okay, so now we need to think through the actual day you bring your new puppy or dog home, what that's going to mean, kind of what's ahead for the next 24 hours, weeks, months, so that you really take advantage of this first stage of bonding with your new dog or pup. First off, you want to get all the products you need. Here to help me is a book, Puppies for Dummies, fourth edition, written by yours truly. And we are going to flip to page 73 to talk about what you need to get, how you need to frame out those first couple of days so that it's a a stress-free or nearly a stress-free experience for both of you. Okay, let's talk enclosures. Now, personally, I love a crate. To me, a crate is a crib, it's not cruel. I like to decorate a crate initially with just old t-shirts and sweatshirts and um, some chews your dog might like, maybe a nice stuffed animal. They have a stuffed animal that actually has a heartbeat and a heating pad, so it feels like another puppy, which is super cool, and I recommend those. If your dog has not been exposed to a crate or your puppy, um, it might take them a while to feel comfortable being shut in, and I have a lot of videos that explain how to sell your dog on a crate, but before even watching those, Make sure you make the crate, even if you have to buy two, kind of the hub of everything. You feed your puppy in the crate. I like to lay down with a pillow with like my head in the crate. Um, If the crate and my child are kind of fit for each other, I'll send a child in the crate and I'll throw biscuits in to the child with the door locked. These are all little ways you can get your puppy excited about a crate, but initially, If they haven't had exposure to a crate, you might also need to get a pen to kind of wrap around the crate and give your dog a little more freedom in and out. That's something you'll have to figure out, but I encourage everyone to get a crate, a playpen if they're gonna need it, and some gates so you can enclose your new dog or pup in a smaller section of your house. Preferably take up the rugs or enclose them in a no rug area And that'll be the first space that your dog kind of perfects their housebreaking habits. When you get a crate, a lot of people want to know, should I get a huge crate that my puppy will grow into or get a small crate? It's really up to you. They have these things um, that are known as dividers that make a big crate smaller. I like to get a small crate for those first month the puppy's home nice, close, small, cozy little crate, and then you can expand to their adult size crate. Okay, so we've now got some enclosures. You're gonna create a routine so you know when they're resting, when they need to go out, when they eat. So we have consistency with the puppy. Then everybody wants to know about toys 
and choose. I find it's most important to see what your dog or puppy likes. Maybe get one ball, maybe get one stuffy, um, maybe get a couple of bones that are adequate for your dog or puppy size. Don't go crazy. Find out what your dog likes and then buy multiples of similar items because certain dogs love to chase balls and others don't. Certain dogs love a latex squeaky, others love um, a fuzzy little stuffed animal squeaky. Find out what your dog likes. You can always go out and buy more. Chewies and busy toys, these are things that will help your puppy self-soothe when you can't be with them or when you're present but not accessible. So there are licky mats, there are foraging mats. Licky mat, you put things they can lick. Foraging mat, you put you hide little treats on this big blanket or circular bed. Those are super important for you to get your puppy excited about. And most puppies will be excited about these two items. Don't buy 20 of them. Buy one, make sure your puppy likes it before you buy multiples of anything. Now, regarding a leash and a collar, you definitely want, if you're bringing home a puppy that's never worn a collar, it's like wearing a barrette. You want to get, If you, I had a daughter, I didn't put a barrette on her until she was four years old. Forget about it. She won't even put a hairband in her hair. She didn't like anything in her hair because I didn't condition it when she was a puppy. Same with a dog. Get them conditioned to a lightweight nylon collar. If it's a young dog, they will grow out of it. But make sure it's um, not too heavy. Don't use a really heavy buckle on like a teacup Yorkie. They're not going to like it. Get size appropriate collar Leash training is a podcast in and of itself. I think I've already created one or two of those. But leash training can come a little bit later. Certainly if you're going outside in the city, uh, you'll have to leash your puppy, but don't tug on their neck too hard. Some dogs that you rescue may never have been put on a leash or a collar, so that's a bit of a transition. But you want to get a leash, collar, appropriate to the age and size of your puppy. I recommend you get a sound machine. They carry them on Amazon. They're these little $25 modules that you plug into the wall and they play like ocean waves, rainforest. There's some white noise because you want to start from day one encouraging your dog or puppy to go to bed on time around eight o'clock. You want to encourage naps that are quiet and uninterrupted. And to do that, you want to make sure you have some music or some uh, white noise playing in the background. So either an Alexa or a noise machine is important to calm them down. Um, bedding. So especially if you have a puppy, don't go whole hog on the fanciest bedding you can buy online. Thick quilted bedding can often trigger a pee response because it absorbs very quickly. So don't do that. If you do have a nice bed for your dog and they are a puppy, put it away until they're at least six months. Fun fact, puppies don't have bladder control, full on bladder control until about eight months, some even a year because bladder has muscles that are used to hold their eliminations and they just don't, they're not born with them. They develop later on. So keep the mats thin. You can use an old sweatshirt or towel, um, but help your dog or puppy identify that all good things happen when they're on their mat or towel or blanket or whatever it is. Treats, food, everybody's got their own thing with food. Some people like to feed their dogs raw. Some people like to cook for their dogs or buy home cooked meals or buy freeze dried raw or buy kibble. So, you know, you be you in that department. I strongly recommend choosing a higher quality kibble or canned food if you're going to go the pre-packaged route. It does make a difference and it is important for your dog to have healthy food. In terms of treats, I wouldn't go the sausage route just because it's heavily processed. I prefer cutting up an apple or a carrot or getting some healthy treats, 
to motivate your puppy's behavior. Remember, if a puppy does something or your new dog does something, let's say they go sit on their mat and you go, yes, I call that a word marker, yes, and give them a treat, that's likely to happen again. And if you're super clever and you put a basket of toys next to their mat and reward them for taking one of the toys from their basket, then you're encouraging good habits from the start. As I always say, when I meet someone or I start training um, a new dog, all good things should happen when your dog or puppy is on their mat. You provide their mat, you put it in a convenient area to a given room, and you reward them with attention and toys and treats and bones when they're on their mat. Then you're on the road to good behavior from day one. Okay, in terms of um, busy toys, you can make a busy toy by just crumpling newspaper and sticking some treats in it, or you know the uh, hollow tube from a paper towel roll, just crimp both ends and toss some treats in it. Those were the original bu busy toys. But now, if you choose, you can go online and spend 20, 30, 40, 80, probably $120. I mean, there are a lot of busy toys out there for dogs. It's up to you. I wouldn't pressure you know, a puppy's IQ from the start, but you can do different busy toys. You can go online. They have some that you have to knock for the treats to come out. Dogs find that fun. It's kind of an enriching activity for them because, you know, a bowl is like, well, there it is, and now it's gone. An enriching activity kind of stimulates their mind. So those are some fun things you can get. In terms of leashes, the most important thing to remember and another fun fact is that young dogs have a powerful oppositional reflex. What's an oppositional reflex, Sarah? Well, if I were to reach through into your living room, grab you by the shirt sleeve and yank you very hard, you would pull back quickly and probably pop me in the face because you have strong oppositional reflex. You don't like being jerked around. And when you put a young puppy who's kind of a prey animal, remember young little puppies until they're six months are defenseless. You put them on a leash and start dragging them around, they're going to have a hissy fit or they'll just stop moving or they'll look super scared. When you have a young puppy or new dog, don't use the leash to pull them around. Don't use the leash to control them. Use communication. I love taking a little cup of treats, shaking it, so my puppy knows, so you can prepare some little treat cups. So my puppy knows if they follow the sound of a treat shaking, they'll get a treat. That's a good way to introduce them to a leash, but give them some freedom on their leash to explore. Again, I could talk leash training for another three hours. The most important thing to remember is that you don't control your dog on a leash. You control them with your enthusiasm, with your voice, use a tree cup to encourage them to like the experience of being on a leash and being with you. And use leashes that are at least six to up to 30 feet long if you're in a field. Like let your puppy explore, that's what they're happy doing. Um, if you're in a city or you're gonna be traveling with your puppy, you wanna get them used to a carrier, so get that. If you're gonna encourage your puppy to go outside to go potty, get an alert bell, an, an alarm, a little bell that they can ring when they need to go out. If you have a super young puppy and you're wondering how to socialize them without exposing them to you know, things and things that are not vaccinated, use a puppy sling. I love a puppy sling or a canvas tent. Those, uh, I have videos on how to use them and an ebook on my website, I think Puppies 101. That'll give you some links to what those are. But either a sling, a carrier, a, even a wagon or a canvas tent are great ways to um, protect your dog from anything harmful while also socializing them. So go through the list, figure out what you need ahead of time, and you can hop over to my website and under downloads, I have a list of things to buy before bringing a puppy or new dog home. And um, get those things together so that you've got the essentials on hand before um, you know the big day arrives. Now, speaking of the big day, it's important to stay really calm because although it's really exciting for you, 
it's going to be a transition for the new dog or puppy. I know everyone thinks, oh, I'm taking them out of the shelter, I'm rescuing them. But dogs who have lived at a shelter for over a week are used to that shelter routine. So a transition out of a shelter or a rescue or a foster home or a litter is really going to shake up your dog or puppy snow globe. They're going to be confused. While there's some that can just hop right into it, most can't. And most are a little cautious. They're a little bit nervous meeting a lot of new people in those early days. So again, you can be excited all you want. You can put it out there on social media, but try to be calm when you bring your puppy home. Prepare yourself for their emotional needs and you know, check yours at the doorway. Now, first days, your puppy's gonna, dog's gonna sniff around. They're gonna be a little disoriented. You're gonna get them accustomed to, here's where we go to eat, and here's where we sleep, and here are the doors of the papers. The first night is the big, big concern for a lot of people who call me before they bring their puppy or dog home. And here's what I tell them. At least for the first four days to a week, sleep near your puppy. Most of them are used to sleeping around other beings, be it dog or people. So if I have a little dog and I'm teaching them to sleep through the night in a crate, I will put the crate on my bed. And if the puppy cries out in the night, I'll just stick my fingers in there, try to quiet them down. If it's a big dog, they're not used to a crate, I've set up a kind of a pen I will sleep on a couch or my husband will take a turn and, and sleep near the dog. You want their transition to be super easy. So prepare yourself ahead of time. So we have gone through the importance of choosing the right dog. Match the energy level of the dog to your household. Think through all the important things like size, coat, personality before bringing your dog home. We've also talked about what to get and how to prepare for that first night. The last thing I wanna to talk to you about today is choosing a veterinarian. Deciding if you're going to purchase insurance for your pet. These are really important things to think through before bringing your puppy home or new dog. Usually an insurance company will prompt you in the early days of bringing a puppy home and that's when you're gonna get the best rate on insurance should you decide to go that route. Veterinarians, choose one that is approachable, someone you feel you can talk to about concerns. Check out the front staff. Do they make you feel welcome? Are you comfortable? These are really important things because this is an alliance that you are going to build and it's going to be kind of the foundation for you and your dog for the next you know, 10 to 15 years. Don't be afraid to ask to speak to somebody on the phone or ask to come into the hospital before you even bring your new dog or pup home. Look for references. The other thing to be mindful with a veterinarian is how they examine your dog or puppy and if you're comfortable with that. Some veterinarians still don't have you come in. They ask you to drop your dog off curbside. I'm not comfortable with this. Maybe you are. Other vets, you know, you go in. It's a traditional being a part of the session. That is preferable to a lot of people. There are also veterinarians that are certified fear-free. And this is a movement I talk about in one of my former podcasts that you can listen to. Fear-free veterinarians cater to your dog's emotional well-being. They use treats. They often do their exams on the floor. They are committed to doing what they can to make your pet feel safe when they come in for a checkup. And I know I've talked about the importance of that socialization phase, but try to pick your veterinarian ahead of time. And then within two or three days, take your puppy or new dog into the vet, take their favorite toys, take lots of treats, engage them with the front staff so your dog makes a positive association to going to see the veterinarian. So I know I covered a lot. If you know of anyone in your life who wants to get a new dog or puppy or is just thinking about it, please send them the podcast. 
If you have any questions about dog training or have a topic you'd like me to cover on a future podcast, leave me a comment on my Instagram at Sarah Says Pets. Remember, training isn't about learning how to control your dog. It's about learning how to communicate with them.